one last chance to end it, bring the lesson. He laughed at me. So I guess he's not going to do it this time. I've finally given up and uh, accept defeat in this matter. But it is good to have Andy with us. and uh, hope that you'll come back and be with us as often as possible. The lesson this afternoon is entitled, A Short Lesson on Repentance, A Short Study of Repentance, as it were. The Bible speaks of repentance throughout. As a matter of fact, I did a computer search on the word repent, and it pulled up words such as repentance, repented, and repent. And it, I didn't make a distinction between whether it was God repenting, as in the case of Noah, or in the Exodus, whenever he repented, he had brought him out and said, I'll make Moses a, a servant. But just basic words, regardless of, of how it's used. The word repent is found 106 times in the King James Version. It's found 64 times in the New Testament of the King James Version. I did a search of the major prophets just to see how many times it was used in the major prophets. And I expected to find the majority of use in the major prophets, but I only found the word 14 times in the major prophets. I was quite surprised about that because much of the major prophets deal with calling Israel to repentance, does it? Or, or Judah to repentance, even though it might not use that very word. Repentance is to be preached as commanded in the Great Commission. We read in Luke 24, beginning in verse 46, Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so whenever men stand up and preach from the day of Pentecost forward, one of the primary thoughts that they are to get across in their preaching and teaching is that of repentance. We must preach repentance. We must teach people to repent. I've heard of individuals who believe all you have to do is to get the people in the water. We'll teach them about repentance. We'll teach them about this being wrong and that being wrong that they're engaged in later. I've heard them talk about getting people in the water. We'll worry about teaching them about the church later on. No, you can't do that. We have to teach them those things that they need to know in order to understand they have obligations. And one of those obligations is to repent of their sins and then as they live their life, as they sin, continue to repent. The word repentance simply means in the Greek a change of mind. It's from the Greek word metanoeo to change in the word mind and that's exactly what it means. True repentance produces conversion. It produces change. Uh, the change that we make, the turning that we make, is not the actual repentance. It is the product of repentance. It is the fruit of repentance, as it were. In Acts 3, verse 19, we see the difference between that, where it says, repent ye therefore, and be converted. To convert is to change. And so the change is really separate from the change of mind. The action is separate from the change of mind. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Even though that's the case, I'm going to be using both the repentance and the product of repentance, the turning about together in this lesson as though it were one. So if I use scripture, speak of the turning about, I'm also speaking of the change of mind and I'll, I want you to keep that in mind so there will not be that distinction so much in this sermon. What produces repentance? Well, there's a number of things. First of all, I believe preaching produces repentance. They were commanded in Luke 24 verse 47 to do what? to preach repentance and remission of sins among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So in order to produce repentance, the first thing people must do is to hear the word. They need to hear the gospel. And what will that gospel produce if they understand it correctly? Well, they'll realize that they've sinned 
And because of that sin and the cost that was paid for that sin in the form of Jesus Christ on the cross, it will produce a godly sorrow. They'll realize they've sinned against God. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And so whenever people hear the New Testament message, whenever they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and they understand that Jesus Christ died for their sins and the terrible sin that they committed against their Creator, they should have godly sorrow. It should produce godly sorrow in their life. In Romans 2, verse 4, we also learn of something else that produces repentance. And we read there, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And so here's something else that has to do with bringing us to repentance. The preaching of the gospel, we learn the goodness of God and what he gave his son for our sins. We learn the price that was paid and his goodness makes it possible for us to have our sins forgiven and enter into heaven. And all the wonderful blessings that come with being, being a Christian, being a, being a child of God. And so his goodness also leads us to repentance. But we have to understand that there's also such a thing as a false repentance, a repentance that cannot save. We read again in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, that the sorrow of the world worketh death. And so we understand that there's a false repentance. It's a sorrow of the world. That's what Judas had, I believe, whenever we read in Matthew 27, verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. What does it say about Judas? He repented himself. He took the money. He took it back. He gave it back to the, to the, uh, the priest and the, the, the leaders there at Jerusalem, cast it down upon the floor. He repented. He returned the money. You'd think that that would save him, but no. It wasn't the right kind of repentance. It wasn't the true repentance. And what did he do as a result? He went out and hung himself. True repentance does not produce a hanging of oneself. True repentance produces one turning back to God, asking God's forgiveness. And there's no indication whatsoever that Judas did such a thing. So his repentance was a false repentance that would not produce salvation. I want to look at repentance a little bit in the Old Testament. Sometimes we realize that repentance was good. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14 uh, God told Solomon after Solomon had completed the temple, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, now listen, and turn from their wicked ways, and repentance and then turn, so we're going to put them together, re repent and turn, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So here we see that he's saying, I'm going to forgive these people when they repent. I'm going to forgive these people when they turn again. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive these people when they turn from their wicked ways, and I'm going to forgive them of their sins. What a wonderful blessing. Repentance can bring forgiveness. Now, I know it's not repentance alone. They had to do more than that, just as we have to today. But this was necessary if they were to receive the forgiveness of their sins. David after he numbered the people, took a census of the people, contrary to the commands of the old law, said Second 2 Samuel 24, verse 10, his heart smote him. And after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. David recognized his sin, and he repented of it. He confessed it before them. There's no doubt that there was sorrow in his heart and that there was repentance there. He also, we also see that in the case of David and Bathsheba after Nathan's rebuke. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 11, David says, I have sinned. He recognized his sin. You know, recognition of one's state is a first step toward repentance, isn't it? You have to realize you're in sin. You have to realize you're doing wrong. And then that should lead you to a state of repentance. Ezekiel 18, verses 21 through 23, it talks 
about mankind in general. The people had said, well, people are inheriting sin because of something their father did or something their mother did. And so in Ezekiel 18, 21 through 23, he says through Ezekiel, but if the wicked will turn from his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. And his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Here's a wicked man. He turns from his wicked ways. He's repented. He has, he's had godly sorrow. He, he knows he's wrong. And he's turning from that. He's turning to the Lord. What does God say? I'm going to forgive him of those things he did in the past. I'm going to wipe them away as it were. And they'll not be mentioned unto him. All those things he's committed. I've heard people say, I'm just too mean and wicked for God to forgive me. I've heard that. You ever heard that, Rick? I know you have because I think you've mentioned it before. Some of these people say, God won't forgive me. What does this say? The wicked turn from his evil ways. I will forgive him. And I'll not hold those things against him anymore. And so God will forgive. Only one sin that I know of that man can commit that he cannot be forgiven of. Love Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin, but there's one exception. Sometimes there's exceptions. You all know what that exception is, don't you? You've heard me say it before. Suicide. That's not the unpardonable sin that we read of in the text, but that, that is a sin that you can't be forgiven of. Uh, he says, he continues in verse 23, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord? and not that he should return from his ways and live. This returning, that's a product of repentance. Going back to the Lord, changing your ways, that's a product of repentance. Repentance being preached here. You change, you turn, you repent, you do these things. But you know, sometimes repentance can be wrong. There's times when repentance can be wrong. In Exodus 13, verse 17, God is going to take the people out of Egypt into the promised land. It says, and that it shall come to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that way was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. <laughs> That'd be a time when it would be wrong to change their mind, wouldn't it? Be wrong whenever they'd change their direction, wouldn't it? Repentance doesn't always work well. Uh, sometimes it's, it's just ineffective. Listen to Hebrews 12, verses 16 through 17. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau was, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for ye know how that afterward he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Here was a man who cried. Here was a man who sought repentance with tears. And yet it was not granted. He received no restitution. For what he had done, selling his birthright, did he? The change would not help in his case. Sometimes a repentance won't. If it's not a godly repentance, it can be the repentance like Judas had, can't it? His repentance didn't help him, did it? If it's not the right kind of repentance, it will not do us any good. And sometimes we can repent, but we still have to pay the price, mightn't we? I go out and I shoot somebody. I go to jail. They give me the death penalty. I learn about the Lord. I obey the gospel. I become a true, honest Christian. And I mean from the bottom of my heart, I believe in God and I want to serve the Lord, do what I can. Does that mean that I won't face death if I've been sentenced to death? Of course not. It doesn't relieve me of that punishment. So sometimes repentance does not bring about a temporal blessing. But I do know this. That if I truly repent and I do what the Lord says up until the time I face that death penalty and I serve the Lord, what did it say? His transgressions will not be remembered. In other words, I'm forgiven. I'm going to stand blameless, not sinless, but blameless before my Lord in the judgment day. In the New Testament, John preached repentance. Repentance. In Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
He had them repent based upon the fact that the kingdom was coming. He had them change their mind about their wicked ways because of that. John called upon some of the Pharisees and Sadducees to show fruits meet for repentance. In Matthew 4, verse 17, we read, no, Matthew 3, verse 8, we read, Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, he says to them. In other words, you haven't shown that you're really repenting. You're just putting it on. Sometimes people do put on. They want to be baptized because their wife, their husband, their son, their daughter, their mother, their father pressures them into being baptized, they think. And so they'll be baptized for the wrong reason. When I was in Tallahassee, I had two older men. One of them, I think one of them was in their 70s, the other one in their 80s. They came, came to me one day and individually at different times saying that they wanted to be baptized. I said, well, you've been a member of this church. One of them had been an elder in the Lord's church for years. They said, we won't be baptized. Or I won't be baptized. Why? Why? You've been faithful. He said, well, I really believe that I was baptized for the wrong reason." I was baptized. I want to be sure I'm saved. I want to be sure I was, I'm baptized for the remission of sins and not because somebody else wanted me to. Sometimes whenever we send our children to camp, we have a problem because I believe it's good for young men and young women to give themselves to the Lord. Don't misunderstand. If a young man or young woman learns the way that God would have them to go, and they're mature enough and responsible enough to do what the Lord would have them to do, certainly. They want to be baptized, they should be baptized. But I believe sometimes we get them all together and one wants to be baptized, it runs like a flame through there. And they're not being baptized because they learn what the Lord wants and they're convicted. They're being baptized because their friends are being baptized. And then it becomes a problem. Then it becomes a problem. Well, we need to preach repentance. John preached repentance. And there needs to be fruits brought forth for repentance. We need to change. That's the fruit of repentance. The conversion, the change in our life is the fruit of the change of our mind. In Matthew 4, verse 17, we learn that Jesus also preached repentance. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Basically the same thing that John the Baptist preached. Repent. Change your mind about your life. Jesus condemned some for failing to repent and states that the works he had done would have brought Sodom and Gomorrah to repentance. In Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24, we read, He began to upbraid the cities where most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which, had, which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But say, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And now Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Can you imagine what he's saying here? He's saying it's going to be more tolerable for that, that land of homosexuals than it is for you Jews which have claimed to follow the Lord which claim to be faithful to the Lord now why did he say that because they rejected the son of God which God foretold was coming in the beginning of time and they refused to repent and do what was right in the eyes of the Lord after certain of the scribes and Pharisees asked for a sign a part of Jesus' response is found in Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The city of Nineveh was a great and wicked city, a warlike city. You know anything about their history? You know that they were a people without mercy a people who did not value life, a people who would take slaves of the peoples around them and treat them in horrible and cruel ways. Well, friends, God had mercy on them because they repented when they heard the preaching of Jonah. But what about these New Testament cities? Jesus came among them greater than Jonah ever would be. The Son of God walks among them. 
And he not only preaches to them, but unlike Jonah, he performs miracles among them. And they say he's doing it by the prince of devils, Beelzebub himself. No wonder Jesus says it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Zidon and Tyre than for them and for Nineveh. The parable of the two sons teaches a great lesson. It's made for the chief priests and elders of the Jews after they ask for a sign, and it is a direct response to them. In Matthew 21, verses 28 through 31, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of the Father? They say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. These scribes and Pharisees, these elders of the people, they thought that they were so righteous and so religious, and they, they condemned the harlots, and rightfully so. And they condemned others who, who were sinners, and rightfully so. But the thing about it was, they couldn't see the sin in themselves. And they were the ones who, as Pharisees and as leaders of the Jewish people, had said, we're going to follow you. One of the things that made the Pharisees the Pharisees was the fact that at one time, certain of the Jews looked around and saw how poorly the people were keeping the law. And they said, we need to get back to keeping the law. Their motives were good in the beginning, but then they became a self-righteous people. They began to think of themselves as above others and... and God is privileged to have us. That's sort of an attitude. And so Jesus said, you're just like this son who said, I go, and didn't. The, younger, the other son, he repented, and he went. Shows the value of repentance, that it's, what, it's that which pleases the Father. And then we have another one, the parable of the lost boy in Luke, the 15th chapter. The son who ran away from home and lived among the Gentiles in a far country. He, began, he joined himself, he glued himself to a citizen of that country. And that man sent him out to feed his swine. And at one point the boy was so hungry he would have even eaten the husk that the swine did eat. But he came to himself, and I love that passage which says he came to himself. Because that means... He awoke to his condition. He realized his condition. And he thought about his father's servants and his father's home and said, even my father's servants have food enough to spare and they have shoes to wear. They're better off than I am. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back home and I'm going to tell my father I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned in thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. If we were to stop right there, the boy would never be welcomed home. You know, sometimes we plan and we say we'll do things and then we never, ever act on them. I know I'm always saying, I'm going to lose this weight. Well, I do, and then I gain it back. <laughs> it don't work very well. But the thing is, we have to act. I'm going to start studying my Bible tomorrow. I'm going to start praying more regularly tomorrow. I'm going to make this right with someone I've offended tomorrow. And then sometimes... We put it off and we put it off and we know we've done wrong but we never act. We never do what we should do and we know we should do it. We could be just like this son if we stopped the story right here. But the story doesn't end here. He not only came to himself, he not only made up his mind to do this, the repentance is there, but he acted upon it. He went back to his father's household. And his father greeted him, he hugged him around the neck, he killed the fatted calf, he put the ring upon his finger, the robe upon his back. And they held a come home party, didn't they? A party like they hadn't seen because a brother had never received a party like that, had he? Matter of fact, his brother was jealous instead of rejoicing like he should have. What brotherly love we see in this case. Friends, we see repentance in this prodigal son. And we see not only repentance, but acting upon that repentance. Another that is a great example of repentance is Peter in Matthew, the 26th chapter, verse 75. 
the, Peter, after he denied the Lord three times, Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter wept. He wept bitterly. But not only did he weep, but he picked him. He let the Lord pick him up, and he picked himself up. And then he went on doing the work which God wanted him to do. He preached the gospel like Jesus said to do, and proclaimed the good news, and he served the Lord. Peter was not without fault. Peter was not without sin. But he was willing to repent of his sin and to do what the Lord said afterward. Simon the sorcerer. In Acts the 8th chapter, verse 22, we remember how he coveted the power to lay his hands upon others and give them the power to work miracles. And he asked to buy this power. And Peter said, Thou art full of gall and bitterness. And you, you, you need to pray to the Lord that this be forgiven you so that he might save you. So that he might forgive you. And what did Simon say? He asked Peter to pray for him, didn't he? I believe that that shows repentance on his part, humility on his part. I believe he humbled himself and repented and that he was willing to serve the Lord at this point. Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me, he said. As we have seen, it's also a part of the Great Commission. Luke 24, verses 46 and 47. But did it stop there? No, the apostles preached it. Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so are we to repent today. How do I know that? Because of Acts 17, verse 31. Whenever he preaches to the people at Athens, he said, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man that he hath ordained, hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So we're told who's to repent? Every man. All men. Everywhere. He now commandeth all men everywhere to do what? Repent. That includes me. That includes you. That includes anybody who desires to come to God. Repentance is necessary in our preaching and in our teaching. There's another example of repentance in the, among the Corinthians. A man had taken his father's wife, committed fornication with her. That's in 1 Corinthians 5. But in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 and 9, we learned that apparently that fornicator had repented because they had withdrawn from him. They had brought him back to repentance, and he pleads with them to accept him back, to receive him without doubtful disputations. And so he repented. We see again that. In Matthew 27, verse 3, just a quick reminder that there's such a thing as false repentance. Judas Repented, but it didn't do him any good. Second Corinthians 7, verse 10, The sorrow of the world worketh death. Repentance shows a proper attitude toward our God, the right kind of attitude. Repentance shows a proper sorrow for sin. Repentance may be toward God and it may be toward man. In other words, if I sin against someone, I need to repent of that. Repentance is necessary for our salvation. Acts 17, 30, and 31. Acts 11, verse 18. Gentiles greater repentance unto life. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. It's necessary for our salvation. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. But if we're not going to be lost, we have to repent. Now that's just one step of the steps of salvation. There's five of them. First one is here. Acts 17, 32 through 34. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, we'll hear thee again this matter. So Paul departed from among them. How be it? Certain men clave unto him and believed. And so we find that his preaching produced what? Produced faith among some, not among all, but among some. Likewise, we're to preach the gospel as well. 
Belief is necessary. John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not at the Son shall not see life. That's pretty clear. If you want to live forever, what do you need to do? Well, one thing you need to do is believe. If you don't want to live forever, what do you want to do? You just don't believe. You'll be in torments for all eternity. That's simple. That's straightforward. Repent. We've talked about repentance. Just notice a few verses. Acts 2, 38. Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Confess, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. I want to notice only verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confessed is made unto salvation. Be baptized, Acts 22, verse 16. And I told Paul, and now what, or Saul at that time, and now why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized, or wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In baptism, you wash away your sins. By the water, no, but by the blood. But you have to contact the water to contact the blood. There's no other way around it. Jesus shed his blood in his death. We contact his de death when we're baptized in water. And when we contact his death, we contact his blood. So our sins are washed away by the cleansing blood of Jesus. And then finally, after having our sins washed away, becoming a New Testament Christian, we live for Jesus Christ. Always and forever. John 8, verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That same statement is just as true for us. We must continue in the word of Jesus Christ if we're to be his disciples. That's the invitation, and it's open for anyone who may wish to respond to our Lord and Savior's invitation for salvation. If you're subject to his invitation, you believe the word of God, you believe on Jesus Christ, you've repented of your sins, or perhaps willing to repent of your sins, willing to confess him before men, and then be baptized in water, for the remission of your sins, just as those New Testament Christians were. Why would you ever want to put that off? Why would you want to risk your soul? Come to Jesus while together we stand and while we sing.